Okay, Jeroboam ruled. First, this is uh, chapter 15 of 1 Kings on page 449. I'd like you to turn to it. Chapter 15 of 1 Kings, page 449. Should have told you that earlier. Jeroboam, while you're looking, I'll put this up here. Jeroboam ruled over the northern kingdom, over Israel, for 22 years. And he was succeeded by his son, Nadab. Uh, at this point, don't worry about which names I want you to learn and which ones I don't. Put them all down. Uh, identify them with the scriptures I will read. Uh, but don't, don't worry about that just yet. I want you to just listen to, get a sense of the movement of the narrative. It's the big picture that's important here. Jeroboam ruled for 22 years, was succeeded by his son Nadab. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 25. Nadab, son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of King Asa of Judah. You notice they always have to, and you, I'm not going to make you do this, but uh, you have these two parallel lines of kings that you have to trace because all the time there are kings in the north, there are kings in the south, and they rule at different lengths. So just uh, be aware of the comparison here. So Nadab came into power in the second year of King Asa, who ruled in Jerusalem of Judah, the great grandson of David. He, that is Nadab, reigned over Israel two years. What happened? Verse 27. Basha, son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Basha struck him down at Gibethon, which belongs to the Philistines. For Nadab and all Israel were laying siege to Gibethon. So Basha, from a different tribe, Jeroboam was from the tribe of Ephraim. You will not have to learn these names of tribes. Uh, Basha, from the tribe of Issachar, kills... Nadab. Thus, Jeroboam's dynasty lasts for two generations for a total of 24 years. So Basha revolts against Nadab and kills him, sets him up in his place. Verse 33, chapter 15, verse 33. Now the rest of the Acts, excuse me, 33, in the third year of King Asa of Judah, Basha, son of Ahijah, began to reign over all Israel in Terza. He reigned 24 years. And then skipping down a little bit, uh, Basha died and his son Elah succeeded him. That's verse 6 of the next chapter. Just stay with me here. I want you to see a pattern. Uh, okay, going down, verse 8, chapter 16, verse 8, in the 26th year of King Asa of Judah. Now, Asa of Judah has been king all this time. Nothing's been happening to him, but already we've had one revolution and two separate dynasties being established. Now it's Elah. In the 26th year of King Asa of Judah, Elah, son of Basha, began to reign over Israel in Terza. He reigned two years. Is the pattern emerging? He reigned two years, verse 9, but his servant Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him when he was at Terza, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, who was in charge of the palace in Terza. Zimri came in, struck him down, and killed him in the 27th year of King Asa of Judah and succeeded him. So Elah is killed by Zimri. And so Basha's dynasty lasts two, year, two generations for a total of 26 years. And then Zimri takes over. Let's read about Zimri. Verse 15. Chapter 16, verse 15. In the 27th year of King Asa of Judah, Asa's been Ju uh, king of Judah now for one, two, three, four, five separate kings in the north. 
Now in the 27th year of King Asa of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days. over Israel. And then it describes how Zimri conspired and killed the king and at the last part of verse 16, therefore all Israel made Omri the commander of the army king over Israel that day in the camp. Omri went up from Gibbethon, all Israel with him, they besieged Terza. When Zimri saw the city taken, he went into the citadel and he burned down the king's house over himself with fire and died. Uh, so Zimri lasted seven days and then when trapped he went into the really kind of a David Koresh scene. He just went into the inner part of his sanctum and set it on fire over himself. And he is succeeded by Omri. And wouldn't you know it, Asa is still king over Judah. There's a significant difference in the political stability of the south and the north. The north is much more unstable because every time they get their fill of kingship, there's always some other figure who's standing up and claiming the loyalties and the leadership of Israel. So the Israelite people are, are, are fickle. They're not supporting a single dynasty, not to say they should, but they're not. But what it's doing is it's really destabilizing the country. And so the, the first period of, of relationships between the North and the South was, was marked by this severe instability. And what that does is it moves into a period of tremendous stability with the advent of Omri as king in the North. Now Omri had three things going for him. First of all, Omri made, well, I guess that wouldn't be first. I think first would be he was a superb military commander. Omri was able, uh, through force of his own personality and his command over his troops, to completely unify the entire country under his leadership. That was the first thing he had going for him. The second thing is he reestablished the alliance with the Phoenicians. You will remember that Solomon had alliances with the Phoenicians. Well, Phoenicia borders the northern part of Palestine, so now it, it, it lies fully within the territory overseen by, by uh, uh, the northern king up here. So. Omri establishes relationships with Tyre and Sidon, the two major Phoenician cities, and it really enriches him. Very, very powerful. And finally, Omri establishes a capital. I haven't really been going over this, but the capital city of the north shifts with every generation. Every generation, every different dynasty establishes its own city, its hometown city as the, as the capital. Well, Omri makes the capital Samaria. And Samaria remains the chief city, the capital city of that northern region uh, almost up until this day. I mean, there still is uh, a significant uh, continuously inhabiting uh, Samaritans who live in the, in the city of Samaria. Uh, 